Your question is a very important one because the Midrash of all the different parts of Torah is least understood by the average Westerner. The popular approach that Western civilization, I'll call it pseudo-Jewish Western civilization, has taken is that Midrash is chas v'shalom, a Jewish equivalent to mythology. So there's mythology and Midrash. And they'll tell you things like, when was the Midrash written? At the same time, the Greek mythology was being written. You see, the Jewish people created their own mythology, their own answers. That statement is pure heresy. I don't care if somebody has letters written after his name for all his degrees, that he calls himself rabbi or any other superlative. To say that a part of the Torah, oral or written, is not sacred, and does not come from Moshe Messinai, is from a Jewish perspective, apikursis. They've left the building of Judaism. Do whatever you want, you remain a Jew, but those ideas are not kosher. Where do we know any of the stories? Where do we know any of the oral Torah from? The answer is it's passed down to us. Passed down to us generation after generation after generation after generation. And the time when Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi made the decision to commit the oral law, the law, to writing, to a, 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 a formal code, to a canon, if you will, but it's not a biblical canon, which is called Mishnah, but it's the origin, the original foundation of the oral law, alongside, they also committed the stories of the Torah. And the stories of the Torah, when it was committed to writing, became known as Medrash Rabbah. Along with Medrash Rabbah, there is also a different kind of, of Medrash, which is part Halacha and part Medrash. And therefore it's called Medrash Halacha. Medrash Halacha is found on the books of Bereshit and Shmot, on a compilation called Mechilta, which was arranged by Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was his disciple, also arranged the Mechilta. It's called Mechilta Drashbi. On the book of Leviticus, Vayikra, the Medrash Halacha is called Safra. And on the book of, books of the Bamidbar and Dvarim, it's called Sifri. So Mechilta, Safra, Sifri is a Medrash Halacha. Stories, but stories that have a halachic bearing. So the Medrash Halacha sometimes will contain similar traditions that's also found in Medrash Rabba, and sometimes other things. In addition to this, we have the this teachers of Kabbalah, which also come from Moshe Messina, which are not documented until the post Mishnah generation, uh, pre Mishnah generation by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That's called Zohar. The Zohar is lost, goes into hiding. Nobody has a Zohar for several centuries it's discovered in, in Spain. The manuscripts are discovered. The next book of Zohar, written by the disciple of Rav Shbi, or the next generation, by Rav Nechunya ben Arkona, is known as Sefer HaBahir. And that we always did have. So when we rediscovered the Zohar, we saw that the statements in Bahir line up. The quotes from Bahir, exactly the same quotes as the Zohar. Then we have collections of Midrash. So for example, the Yemenite Jews, had Midrashim they preserved for generations. It was manuscript from generation to generation. This is called Yalkut Midrash Teman. Those Midrashim are very similar to the Midrashim we have. There's Midrash Hagodel. There's Midrash Shochartov. There's Midrash Seicheltov. Then in the ninth century, there was a great tzaddik whose name was Shimon Barabun, maybe, or I'm mixing him up with somebody is something called Yalkut Shimoni, where he took all the different midrashim that he had received from his teachers and he arranged them into one lucid collection. Now, here's the amazing thing. These different collections of midrashim were oftentimes compiled by people who had received them from people who received them from people, but they were living in different places of the world and they were incommunicado. The Jewish people living in Alsace-Lorraine or what's today France or Germany, were not really in communication with the Yemenite Jews. And yet the Midrashim line up. Same, same ideas, same teachings. How is that humanly possible for them to come to the same mythology? The answer is it isn't. Very compellingly, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are for the most part, people think, biblical scrolls, it's not exactly so. There's a significant portion which is pure gibberish, written by the people who lived there who had their own Judaism, the, akin to many other non-Torah Jewish movements. So there was, that's an old phenomenon too. 
There's not a single Sefer Torah there. Not a single, not even a fragment of a Torah. Why? My personal theory, when they had to abandon, because the Romans were coming, probably, they took the Torahs and they ran. You ever see pictures of the Jews who were chased out of the villages in Ukraine after the Communist Revolution? There are photographs. The two most common things you'll see is a rabbi at the head flanked by people like Chazan Shochet or whatever, and what are they holding? Torahs. You see a crowd of Jews, you see people holding Torahs. All these communities had libraries. Some of them, the library possessed tens of thousands of books. Where did the books go? You couldn't take the books. You took the Torah. So my guess is that these were non-halachic Jews, but nonetheless they still revered the Torah. They left their library behind. They did not take the, to the, 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 the scrolls. How did they write Medrash? Very interestingly, they had a certain style which has only been adopted now in recent, the last few years, a phenomenon now where we have English Chumashim, which are written where the scripture is translated, and then in parentheses, we have the ideas from Rashi that are written into the, into the, into the text. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them are Midrashic scrolls. So for example, the story of the Akeda in one of the scrolls of the Dead, Seas, Dead Sea Scrolls, it narrates how Yitzchak, is taken onto the altar at Maria. How the, how the angel says, let him go. And then there is a Midrashic story inserted right into the body. And the Midrashic story is about Yitzchak going to Gan Eden, which is the same Medrash you have in Medrash Rabba. So you have a Medrash Rabba, and you get a postcard from antiquity. You got yourself the scroll, which nobody ever imagined would be found someday, and really couldn't have stood the test of time, but only because of the unique arid temperature there that it was preserved. Not everything was preserved that well either. And it's taken technology to open these scrolls. Some of them are just like burnt fragments or dried up fragments. But they, they actually managed to open them up and decipher them. They're all deciphered. They're all written. So in those Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a medrash, an actual medrash that's identical to the medrash we have, which Rashi even alludes to that medrash. Think about the chances of that. So this is, this is the, the medrashic ideas. They're not just stories. Now, it is true that when we come to stories of the Torah, and the Rebbe did not like using the word tales, because tales, like tales of the Talmud, tales sounds like tall tales. Stories are stories. <coughs> Excuse me. The stories of Torah are not always literal. Not every medrash is literal. And certainly not every story in the Gemara is literal. Some of these stories are narratives. Narratives that use parabolic language or in, involve euphemism or some kind of anthropomorphism sometimes. It's not always literal. We, we, we use spe specific language to convey something. With the sages either weren't unable to convey the truth, the profundity of what they understood because they, the, the reality didn't exist yet. Like, for example, the Gemara that talks about a demon whose name is Radio who can go from one end of the world to the other. Do you know that radio is one of the only words that's the same in every single language in the world today? From Chinese to Russian, from Arabic to English, Hebrew, of course. Yes, radio. It's, an, it's a universal word. The Gemara says the word radio, reish dalad yud aleph, calls it a demon. What did you want the Gemara to say? What word should it have used? Radio wave? Gale radio. That would go very well. For people, <laughs> sound ridiculous. So now, in the last century, all of a sudden, oh, now we understand the Gemara. Or the Gemara that says, in the end of time, before Mashiach will come, a bird will drop an egg and the whole city will be destroyed. Today, to anybody who hears that, that's a natural description of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But imagine the times of the Talmud. Imagine how ridiculous that sounded. A bird will drop an egg and a city will be destroyed from an egg. Right bombed by a scrambled egg. Well, it sounds ridiculous. But the truth is that bombs are that shape. The Gemara has something called Agada. The Agada is the stories of the Gemara. In the stories of the Gemara, it says, Rov Sodot HaTorah Nignuzim Ba'agadata, that the greatest secrets, the vast majority of the Torah's secrets, are encoded into Agada. But it cannot be always taken literally. 
Sometimes it can certainly not be taken literally. And sometimes we're not sure. We don't always know if it's literal or if it's not literal. This is the challenge. So, for example, we have a description in the Gemara of the distance from planet Earth to the Sun. And it says it's Mahalach Tov Kuvshana. It would take us, if we were to walk 500 years. Now, I never did the math. But it's eminently possible that to us to get from here to the sun, if we were walking, take the average person when a person could walk a day, maybe it would take 500 years to walk that distance. It's possible. It sounds reasonable. Here's the problem. The Gemara then describes the next planetary orbit, and then the Gemara starts talking about the feet of the angels. Now, the feet of the angels is not a, is not a literal thing. It's not material. The angels don't dance in Jupiter. So, so what is it talking about? So then it becomes euphemism. It's a metaphor. It can't be taken literally. Then heaven is not talking about outer space. Heaven is talking about a spiritual concept. And oftentimes, this is the challenge with deciphering the pages of the Gemara, that we don't know where the literal description ends and where the metaphoric or sp a spiritual description begins. Do, or do they even overlap? Or was, some, or was that not even meant literally? So we had some of the great minds, of the, uh, the great sages of, of the late Middle Ages, who actually devoted themselves to writing compilations and explaining this. The Maharsha lived about 500 years ago. He write, he, the Maharsha wrote commentary on Rashi and Tosfos in the Gemara, but he also wrote commentary on the stories of the Gemara. And the Maharsha's book is called Chedushi Halochas Ve'agadot. So he has profound, profound insight into Rashi and Tosfos, but also beautiful homiletic insight into the stories. Maharal of Prague, more recent, I think about 400 years ago. He wrote a whole treatise of ways to explain the different stories. The Chida wrote in Ben Yehiyada, wrote a whole book about explaining some of these stories. And they're all messages, and they're all true, and some of them are multi that has multiple messages. And sometimes the sages use a specific euphemism in a story because they had to convey a truism that would be applicable in every time and in every place. And that everybody would have to take the mores of the society they lived in and read into it and understand how this Torah idea is, speaks to you now. But has to speak to you and has to speak to them and has to speak to everybody in between. So no typical or normative form of language would have sufficed. So we don't know what's literal or not. That's the problem with Medrash. I use the word problem loosely. This is the challenge with Medrash. When Rashi quotes a Medrash, then we know it's literal, because Rashi is Pshuto Shal Mikra, the literal interpretation. But when it's not we're not told that it's literal, then, then we don't know always. Or sometimes nobody knows. Rabbi Saji Gohan said that a person who takes even a single word, single word of the Torah and says it's not literal, is an apikoros. So if, if you don't believe that one of the people in the Torah lived or lived for as long as the Torah says he lived, you're an apikoros. But that's scripture. Unless, he says, sometimes dibar akos of lashon havai. Sometimes the scripture definitely uses exaggerative terms. For example, cities that reach the heavens. That's an exaggerated term. It's a euphemism. What do we call that in today in English today? A skyscraper. Orim bitsuris adashmaim. Cities that were fortified to the heavens. What does that mean? Skyscrapers. It means that they had a defense mechanism that could protect them from aerial attack. The Gemara seems to indicate there was some kind of, there were flying devices in the time of the Talmud. Is that literal? Is it just a story? Till today we don't know. Did they, did they have gliders? Were, they, were, those gliders, were some of those gliders somewhat mechanized? Did they have the ability to remain in the heaven for an extended period of time in the air? It could be. We don't know with certainty. So when it comes to scripture, scripture must be taken literally. When it comes to non-scripture, there we can't be certain. So sometimes it's a metaphor, and sometimes it's not. It says that the pharaoh was a, a foot and a half high, a foot and a half wide, his beard was a foot and a half, and his male organ was a foot and a half. This guy sounds like R2 from Star Wars, like R2-D2, like with some kind of freak, some kind of, so you think that's literal? I, I don't think it's literal. I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a descriptive term. I think it, give, it gives us an insight into the evil of this person. He probably was very short. He probably had a long beard. He probably had oversized organs. I, 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 I get it, but it was exactly those dimensions. <laughs> it, it does not sound logical. And that we don't have to accept it. We don't have to say that it's literal. It's not scripture. That, that easily is understood. The Gemara talks about somebody who was so fat that when he stood next to his friend who was so fat, a, a flock of sheep could walk underneath their stomachs. 
or that there, there were certain people in the Midbar that were so tall when they died, they were like, they were in a knee up, and that a, a fellow on a camel holding a long spear could ride underneath the ark created by the knee. You think that's literal? It's euphemism. It's euphemism. It's metaphor. It's not literal. Scripture is literal. Absadji Gorn is very careful about that. But it's all true. It's all true. We may not fully understand the truism. But it's all true. So what's our job? Is try to understand the Torah. First thing is to come to the Torah with utmost respect. Say, this is Hashem's Torah. This is sacred. This is holy. Now I try to understand it. It's not for me and you to intuit what things like that mean. These are the greatest sages who knew the entirety of the Torah, who had a profound and really inimitable grasp of the whole structure of Torah. So every word they said was in consonance with the whole structure. It didn't, it didn't contradict anything. When people reach that level of, of acuity and mastery and connection to Torah, they usually also have a little bit of elevated consciousness, then they can share with you ideas of what that means.